10% of our, our day is spent thinking and reflecting. When most of our lives are spent trying to fill this thing up with knowledge, we only do that for about 10% of our time. I'm Daniel Forrester, and I wrote the book Consider, Harnessing the Power of Reflective Thinking in Your Organization. I'm a consultant, uh, and I've been in this business of thinking along with clients and with leaders for most of my adult life. I've been in rooms where people have been trying to structure problems uh, and think through what is it the problem that they're trying to solve and then help to give them frameworks and answers to it. So I felt pretty qualified to enter the dialogue around reflection because I think it's something that I've helped my, I've gotten paid throughout most of my adult life to help to do that. Um, as I got into it also, I, I just like everybody else, I don't want to come across as though I'm holier than thou. I'm not. I've made my fair share of mistakes with not stepping back to think through problems. I too have been in that habitual routine to have immediacy overcome reflection. I wanted to write a book that would help me discover some new answers and I learned as much as I hope anyone else is going to learn from what they read in the book. The firms that are able to step back from the orthodoxy, question it, and even over-authorize people inside the firm to say, I wonder why we do it that way, should we do it that way? and not just have their voices squashed down in any one session, even the most junior person to speak up, that's a firm that has and, and practices reflection a little bit more than most. It's about forcing the habits on an annual basis in which to step back from the fundamental assumptions that drive the firm and question them. Because if you don't, then they become orthodoxy. And if you have orthodoxy built up over time, it's kind of like plaque that develops inside your veins. And once you get plaque sooner or later, it congeals and we know what happens to people who have too much plaque. I think another example of firms that are reflective are ones who don't allow the way that they create a strategy to become inside an echo chamber of just the leadership of that company. What do I mean by that? Uh, Kyle Bass, as I got to know him and the work that he does with Heyman Capital, one of the things that was fascinating is that when Kyle has a kernel of an idea, he certainly bakes it inside his team and he will put together a hypothesis and my gosh, it's really well thought out across hours and hours and hours and hours. He, he brings the smartest minds together, but then he takes it one step further. He open sources that idea to people who should know more than he does about the topic and then he asks them to sort of say, please punch a hole in it. Please tell me that I'm wrong. Please tell me that this isn't the color blue. That's very atypical. I, I interviewed Tad Allen in the context of what he had done not only in his career as he was stepping down as Commandant, but also in the context of Katrina, which still has many lessons learned and we're all digesting lessons learned right now of the oil spill. There is a set of habits of that man and a capacity to take on and think through problems that I think is formidable and much to be learned from. And it was just sitting there for one hour, just was playing back the tape. The nuances of what he discussed was extraordinary. Um, I got to know Ken Feinberg in this study as well, uh, another reflective thinker that we don't, we, we tend to give very atypical assignments to. Ken is the man who ran the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. He then moved on to be the Pazar for President Obama and now he's working on figuring out how to disseminate the $20 billion for BP. My question was not only is it atypical assignments, but how do you structure that time? Ken is a learning person. He would recognize the mistakes that he made on 9-11, working on victims' compensation, and how he's not trying not to repeat that today. General Petraeus pops to mind. Um, uh, some bias there in the sense that I've spent an inordinate amount of time studying him. I've watched him on videotape uh, operate inside rooms and contexts, and the military gave me some uh, incredible access to him, not only spending time with him and understanding it, but he and I engaging in some dialogues. The way that he problem solves and structures and thinks through problems, there's so much for leaders to learn from in his example. These leaders and what, their, what our country asks of them today, I think they take on a complexity and a context that is just stunning. So three of them really stand out in my mind. And then also on the commercial side, uh, more, more leaders like Brooks Lee Bourne, who was the head of the CTFC and an attorney in the derivative space back in the 1990s, who warned the world about well, what are the consequences of over-the-counter derivatives? She recognized that there was a good side, but she also saw that there was a potential bad side. She wanted to go there. At the same time, I juxtapose her in the book with Kyle Bass, the hedge fund manager. He's really a global investor now out of Texas, who saw the storm coming in terms of the financial crisis and actually put in a set of, a set of bets against it and profited from it. What was going on? And that, that's interesting, but what was really interesting to me was what are the habits that those two people have in mind? How do they structure their time alone? 
why did they develop a mindset where they were able to see something? I call them Cassandras in the book because they were. What are those habits? Uh, I've studied those, all those folks that I mentioned, but there's so much more. I just, I, I think I barely scratched the surface of their reflective habits.